The Portfolio Composer, episode 183. You're listening to the Portfolio Composer podcast with your host and coach, Garrett Ho, where he teaches you what it takes to master the business end of writing music through mindset, marketing, and business skills. Make sure to sign up for the newsletter at theportfoliocomposer.com for exclusive offers, business insights, and information not shared on the podcast. And now for this episode of The Portfolio Composer. I tell my students, I want them to be able to make a living while they're sleeping. Music is 24 seven and it's around the world. I wanna be able to sleep in the United States and know the music's being played in Asia at the exact same time. This episode is sponsored by Dorico, the future of scoring. Dorico is the music scoring software of the 21st century, allowing you to write, publish, and play back music notation to the highest professional standards. Created by the world's foremost experts, Dorico marries art, engineering, and AI, resulting in scores of unparalleled balance, warmth, and beauty. Visit dorico.com slash TPC to download a fully functioning 30-day trial version of the software. Hey everyone, welcome to this episode of the Portfolio Composer. I am your host, your coach, your teacher, Garrett Hope. This interview was recorded at the Midwest Clinic last December, and Robert W. Smith and I tried to find a quiet corner of the enormous McCormick Center in Chicago, and he graciously gave me a half hour of his time to answer my questions about the business of composing and band music and all of that. Robert is a uh, very smart individual who has had tremendous amounts of success, especially in the concert band and marching band world. He is one of the most popular and prolific composers in America today, and he has over 600 publications in print, with the majority composed and arranged through his long association with Warner Brothers Publications and the Bellwin Catalog. He is the president and CEO of RWS Music Company, exclusively distributed through C.L. Barnhouse. In addition, he is currently teaching in the music industry program at Troy University in Troy, Alabama. I hope you enjoy this interview as much as I did. There was a time in my life, by the way, I'm, I'm working at Columbia Pictures, I handled two product cat- catalogs. I handled marching band and I handled orchestra two opposite ends of the spectrum. And thank goodness I had really good teachers and really good experiences to be able to handle both of those. So I ended up uh, you know, wearing two caps, but it was success, uh, incredible success with a whole lot of very wonderful people around me uh, in that marching band world that allowed me to take steps into other areas. So it is very, very important that we, as young composers, pick an area, find something you're passionate about it, and really, really uh, go into depth that far exceeds Uh, Please understand that our reach exceeds our grasp. Can you elaborate on that? Yeah. Sometimes we can reach something, you know? Yeah, we can can touch it with the tip of that finger. But to actually get close enough to where we can actually grasp this, hold it in our hand, and will it to whatever we want to achieve, now we've got something. Reach exceeds grasp. We're not looking for reach. We're looking for grasp. And grasp being traction, commissions, performances, sales of scores? Correct. Absolutely. Absolutely. One of the things you had told me about before we hit record here is that through your work teaching at Troy, uh, is you believe it's important that composers learn the production end of music, but also the business side. And you listed off a few things, marketing, finances, funding, all that stuff. Talk to me about this essential skill set that you think all composers, no matter where you are in your career, you have to develop to be successful today. Absolutely. Composers, um, unlike those that might be uh, called performing artists, uh, composers oftentimes are one man, one woman shows. You know, you're, you're running a business. Uh, you're running a business. You've got to understand uh, the, the tax implications. Uh, right now, even in, in today's world, I'm watching the news this morning. We just passed a new tax code waiting on a presidential signature that may come as early tomorrow. That's going to change the landscape for everybody in 2018. If you don't have a legal business entity, and for young composers, I suggest they start out with a limited liability company, an LLC. Learn 
to form an LLC. Uh, it's fairly simple to do. You know, and all of a sudden now, uh, handling that financial, uh, uh, I'll call it commitments, responsibility structure, is, is what's going to give you, uh, I'll call it the peace of mind and the framework to allow your, created, uh, your creative time not to be encumbered by other things. Um, we have to, we're our own arts manager. You know, we have to brand ourselves. We have to put ourselves in a position where people will recognize uh, the worth of, of, of our music. And that comes in so many different ways. You know, so we have to market ourselves. We have to be our own accountants, you know, uh, uh, across the board. And, and so it is so incredibly important that our composers realize that they must be entrepreneurial. They must be business owners. They must be entrepreneurs in order to sustain, not just achieve, but to sustain a career. I tell my students, I want them to be able to make a living while they're sleeping. Music is 24-7, and it's around the world. I want to be able to sleep in the United States and know the music's being played in Asia at the exact same time. And then all of the music being properly copyrighted, proper, proper registrations, okay? Registrations not only with our copyright office, copyright.gov, but also with whatever your PRO, Performing Rights Organization, ASCAP, BMI, CSAC. Uh, even now, understanding what sound exchange is. I'm amazed at how many people don't know what sound exchange is. And that is the uh, rights organization that actually handles all the digital stream streaming in the world and making sure they're members of sound exchange, knowing that when that recording is playing somewhere on Pandora, Spotify, you choose your streaming service, okay, that uh, 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 hopefully a, a few pennies will be going into a coffer somewhere that will get to them. So it's very, very important to understand the business aspect. What kind of mindset issues do you encounter when you're speaking with composers who believe that to market yourself is anathema? It's an against the creative spirit. That's a, a common problem uh, in my opinion, uh, at multiple, from multiple perspectives within uh, even the world we're in right now at the Midwest Band and Orchestra Clinic here, you know, with our conductors, our composers, uh, you know, uh, we somehow um, might not uh, remember that, uh, you know, it, uh, we, are, we are here for a purpose, you know, we're here for a purpose. And they like to think that possibly that artists... Uh, uh, may not have that responsibility to market themselves. Uh, in my opinion, art must be sustainable. It must be sustainable. You know, we cannot spend our lives in the next generations with our hand out saying, please, please help us, you know, fund this. Uh, you know, if, if we do, our art is going to die. Again, I tell my students, you know, if a tree falls in the woods and there's nobody there to hear it, is there sound? 90% of them will say yes. And I have to go through an explanation letting them know that no, it's not. Sound incur it occurs in the human brain. You know, in our case, it's in the human brain. It has to be transduced. You know, it's, when that tree falls, it's just simply a fluctuation in air pressure. But by the time we go through the ear canal, the ear drum beginning to vibrate, that sack of fluid, those mechanical bones, the cilia, the receptors that'll transduce energy from acoustic, okay, to mechanical, then ultimately to electrical, and those impulses going into the brain, that's when it becomes sound. So unless somebody's there to hear it, is there really music? I feel the same way. And a lot of composers that I work with um, have this sense that to put yourself out into the world, it's kind of like Kevin Costner in Field of Dreams. Well, I built my website. I have a Facebook professional page. People will come to me. What do we have to do? Because that's not true, right? It's absolutely not true. You know, it's just not going to happen. You know, we right now in our digital world, our new digital millennium, we have to rise above the noise. And by noise, that, that can be pun somewhat intended. It also could be metaphoric, you know, where so many people have access to all these resources now. You know, there's a whole lot of music out there. How does the quality rise to the top? And what does it take to draw attention to that? I contend with our songwriters, with our composers, perhaps outside of the, the art of creating music, the most important thing is going to be their marketing skills. How do they get people to notice them and notice their music? That's so incredibly important. Yeah, I, I agree. I love what you're saying here. Thank you so much. Um, if, if you could go back in time, what would you tell yourself as a 20-year-old? Uh, great question. Yeah. Um, I, I feel fairly fortunate. Uh, I've lived kind of on the edge, on the cusp of, uh, of uh, conformity, yet being fairly radical, okay? Uh, I would tell myself uh, to continue to embrace new technology, all right, uh, uh, and not resist change, because with every change uh, equals opportunity. 
you know? And, and the human instinct to resist change uh, now creates not just an opportunity, but a, a caveat for success. Uh, I've always been uh, the embracer of technology. If I could give myself some, uh, uh, some advice, I would, for my 59-year-old self, I'd say embrace the new technology, but wait a year before you implement. You know? <laughs> <laughs> let it let, let, exactly, <laughs> exactly. I was talking with a writer about that this morning. You know, a uh, wonderful new composer that I'm working with. You know, and, uh, and we're talking about versions of notation software. You know, and uh, I'm a, I have both Finale and Sibelius on my machine. I use them both. I've been using Finale since it came out. You know, I know it like the back of my hand. But uh, there was a time when I was always looking for that new version. You know, and then now I realize that you know. Finale 2012 does everything that we need in the publishing business right now, you know, as opposed to uh, Finale 25, although Finale 25 has been rock solid, you know, uh, rock solid. But uh, no, we don't, uh, don't implement too soon, you know. You know, don't let your business and your, your, your creative thought suffer, you know, so, uh, so embrace the new technology. I also would um, uh, remind uh, myself, I did, a, think, a fairly good job, but I would probably encourage me to do even more exploration into uh, alternative forms of music. You know, uh, for example, the epiphany of really realizing that, uh, that if you listen to it, hip hop and bluegrass are very closely related. It's just sound source is different from string to you know, some electronic drum uh, percussion instrument, but it is so close, you know, and why? Because it comes from that, again, universal human condition, people living, you know, on the earth, you know, in, in uh, agrarian kind of societies and whatnot, you know, to be able to start making those connections. Um, I grew up in the great state of Alabama. My father was from New York and Pennsylvania, uh, was uh, Army. He's buried in Arlington. Uh, he was stationed at Fort Rucker, Alabama, met my mother. And uh, so I have uh, New York uh, paternal roots, uh, Pennsylvania paternal roots, and deep south Alabama you know, roots. I, I kind of grew up not being overly enamored with, with country music, you know, because I, I was that classical pianist. I'm sitting here and I'm practicing, I'm doing my thing, and I just couldn't find the beauty in that. And I still remember it was 1996, and I was... Uh, in Dublin, Ireland, and having a new piece premiered, it ended up being a fairly standard piece for a band now called Ireland of Legend and Lore. It's about a grade four, uh, you know, piece for concert band, and it was being premiered over there. And actually going in and really realizing the connection of, of Irish and Scotch Irish music, you know, and the connection to my home in Alabama, which had then spawned a genealogy a journey. My mother's maiden name is Wyndham. You know, I have a great grandfather's picture who hangs in the halls at Oxford, you know, uh, and uh, he had two sons and sent them over. One of them settled in Alabama. Uh, he was the mayor of the town. He was the schoolmaster. The school's named after him now, you know, in, in that little town. It's just really amazing. But the epiphany of like, oh my God, I, I've been shunning this. And all of a sudden I realize this connection. So trying to find the connections, the human element in all forms of music, I think is uh, not only important, it's beyond enlightening for composers. Yeah, I love that. I love drawing the connections and it really is, it's all related in the end. As you built your career, did you ever want to throw in the towel? Did you ever feel like quitting? And if you did, what'd you do to conquer that? Um, yes and no. Uh, the only time I could even say yes to that had to do when a time when I was, I, my undergraduate degree is in music education, you know. Uh, there really wasn't uh, a degree, uh, and I'm, I'm a teacher through and through. I, I will tell you uh, bluntly and honestly, aside from being father and husband, uh, the most important role for me is a teacher, you know, and passing on. I had great teachers that helped me, and I paid them back by paying it forward to the next generation. Uh, however, earlier in my, early in my career, uh, in the 80s, mid-80s, I I found myself, while well, I'm trying to be a composer and then I'm teaching in multiple situations, I really burned myself out uh, as a teacher. There just were no more hours in the day, you know, and uh, I really burned myself. So I took, a, I took about a six month sabbatical from teaching, you know, and uh, just as a head adjustment and it worked for me. You know, I went right back into the classroom and I've never stopped since. Uh, so, uh, so I've been uh, uh, teaching, I've been passionate about uh, not just composition, but uh, writing, publishing, the business of music, and then the connectivity of all that. One of the big laments I'm going through right now, separate but related subject, 
has to do with uh, the world of music education and then uh, our publishing world and the licensing and the appropriate legal performance of, of music. And we need to be working in tandem. We don't need to be adversarial. And uh, right now we're in a, a cloud of adversity, you know, uh, between education and perhaps uh, the perception of music industry. I can speak, at least on behalf of my little corner of the industry, no, uh, we honor education, you know, and, and we want to make sure that, uh, that uh, we're working together, you know, for this incredible art and for our musicians of the future. But uh, I've never really burned myself out with the exception of that one sabbatical. And frankly, I was just, I was working too many hours, you know. Uh, I, uh, in fact, I just had a conversation before you and I had this meeting now where I was looking at an incredibly successful composer, uh, excuse me, conductor, and uh, he had, he's been doing really well. And I looked at him and said, please remember, you got to take care of you, you know, in order to sustain my, my mother-in-law, who was, uh, may she rest in peace, uh, she uh, was an incredible teacher, but she said, you got to teach for the long haul. You're running a marathon. You're not running a sprint. You know? And so as a composer, we must make sure that we manage our lives, manage our time, make sure we have a balance between the things that make us unbelievably human and then our art. You know? And then you'll find that that art does identify your humanity. You know? Until then, it might be two separate worlds. We may not see that connection. This episode is sponsored by Dorico, the future of scoring. And we want to feature real Dorico users so you can know that real composers out in the world today are using Dorico to make their careers happen. Uh, my name is Reginald Unterzeer. I am a composer, conductor, voice teacher, musician of a variety of sorts. It does absolutely everything I need. Plus, every time a new feature is released, it does it with depth and clarity that I have never seen in any programs to date. Right now, I think my favorite, I'm just finally figuring out the idea of flows. I'm, I'm deep into a multi-movement choral orchestral soloist project. And so, so there are certain um, aspects of that that I had not explored at all and had, didn't really need. And now that I see how they work, it's, I, it's, it's going to be a tremendous help when I get into the you know, rehearsal and distribution of, of, of scores phase and, and revisions phase. I, I, it just makes the, w- the way that flows are set up makes it a single document that works for all the different movements of it. And I, I, I'm loving that. The number one benefit is the fact that I, I believe this pr- um, program has legs, that there's going to be updates that come up, that come out regularly. The, the team that runs it is a reliable, solid team. The, um, the people who own it are responsible and have and ha- have a commitment to the musical community. This was my big problem with the platform that I left. It was like, ah, this platform has been abandoned and I do not want to spend another cent on it. I definitely recommend Dorico. My number one thing is that it, pr- it actually presents a path forward as my work continues. I, I am 62 years old. Learning a new program is daunting. I really like the way that the scores look. They, they, they just seem very natural. The spacings work so much better. The, the way that choral scores work now, the way that it works with lyrics, the way that it works with layouts. I went back to a, I was with a choir doing a, 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 a piece that I had put together in another program eight, 10 years ago. And they were asking me all kinds of questions about what is this note and what is that? Is that a tie? Is that a slur? Is that a this thing? And I was looking back at it and I was going, oh, yeah, they really fixed that problem, didn't they? Because I don't get those questions with Dorico. People look at the notes and they play the notes or sing the notes and it makes sense. They don't have to figure out what the program meant by it. Um, I run into programs, uh, in, into problems with in rehearsals oftentimes when, when tracking the eye across the page confuses them rhythmically. And I have not had that problem at all with Dorico. Again, it seems to be... It, it gets out of the way of the interface between composers' intentions and, and musicians' reading. Uh, rather than introducing barriers, it removes barriers, and I like that a lot. The kind folks at Dorco have set up a special web page so you can go and download a free 30-day trial copy of Dorico. So go and do that. I am, have been using the program, and I'm absolutely in love with it. Go to dorico.com slash TPC. Since we're at Midwest and you see a lot of composers, I mean, that showroom floor, there's got to be a couple hundred people walking around wanting to sell their music and promote their music. And at various levels, there's people who have been doing this for decades, such as yourself. You've got 
the David Maslankas of the world and the Frank Tichelis and all these people who have already kind of made it. But you also have people who are trying to break out. What kind of advice could you give these composers who are here wanting to connect with directors, wanting to get their music in front of ensembles? What's the best things they can do? What's the 10% that will make a difference? Um, that's a really great question. I, I take my students and, and I do a, a lecture on, on this very subject. And uh, I, I ask them, so I'll ask you, do you believe music is a language? I do. Okay, very good. So do I. I think it's the universal language, no translation required. So let's think about the way that we actually learn and, and teach a language. You know, when that infant child comes into the world, we uh, do not take a piece of paper with a word written on it, D-A-D, -D, and sit there and go dad and try and get them to read the word. No, we, we get them to associate dad, the, the syllabic formation of the word, and this image they're seeing of, of dad's face, you know? So then we teach them to read later on, okay? When that child then begins to take those words and formulating their own thoughts, what do they do? They start by mimicking success, they start by sentences that mom and dad or family members are saying. And pretty soon, once they have a command of that, they take successful uh, language endeavors and then begin to put their own ideas together. I tend to think that sometimes young composers, and I am all about, uh, please, uh, exploration and, and new art and new voices. However, uh, we can't lose the connection to the language. And so oftentimes, uh, you know, with my students, I make them study uh, benchmark compositions, you know, uh, uh, icons, you know, exemplars. And, and let's look at the way that this composer did this. Let's look at the way Stravinsky, you know, sat here, look at the scoring, you know, in the, in the Rite of Spring, where he totally turned the orchestra upside down. You know, in fact, there were riots there. You know, they just couldn't believe it. The strings couldn't believe they were not the most important, you know, in that particular work. That was very, very, very important. You know, now, and by the way, I, I, every 10 years I celebrate my birthday. I'll be doing it next year. I'll turn 60 next year. And uh, for the uh, uh, fourth, almost fifth time now, I will actually be doing an in-depth study of, of Rite of Spring because I still have not reached the depths of that artistic work yet. And, and I find that every 10 years as I explore this in depth and go through this, I hear more things. I had a really wonderful composer, John Harbison, won a Pulitzer Prize, and he looked at me and he said, Robert, the more I study, the more right notes I hear. Yeah. yeah. And so uh, Stravinsky still is uh, not let me down, and every 10 years I go back and I study. So I would tell those young composers, let's look at those exemplars, look at those composers and, and, and that music that you admire so much, and let's look at how they did what they did, and let's learn their language, and then let's put that into our toolbox, into our skill set and then reach a point where you start finding your own voice. I was so very, very, very uh, 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 lucky to have uh, some really great teachers. My, uh, there was a composer uh, uh, by the name of Paul Yoder, uh, and uh, he uh, was an incredible educational composer uh, and uh, did amazing things in his career. Uh, so he was, he, taught, he was my teacher during my undergrad. And it was interesting, though, at my, uh, in my graduate experience, I went to the University of Miami, and uh, I was there in Alfred Reed's program. So I had Alfred Reed and a gentleman by the name of Jim Progress were my two teachers. And uh, to sit there and study Alfred Reed's scores, you know, to talk with him, uh, I still think he might be the all-time master of, of voicing and orchestration for the band. You know, his, his voicing was just incredible. So that, that experience to me was so invaluable. But I do know for a fact, after going through that with him and studying uh, uh, scores and exemplars, that I probably then, as I go back now and look at my string of publication compositions, I found my voice probably about two years later, you know, with a, with a couple of pieces that ended up now. They're still, you know, it's everything from the, the Tempest uh, to End of the Storm, uh, you know, all of a sudden then the Divine Comedies are coming out, uh, you know, Africa Ceremony, Song and Ritual, things that have become standards now. And those were all in that, in the early 90s, but it was after that very intense study. You know? Yeah, I, I, I think that's really important to develop our voice. Um, part of the perspective I'm taking through this podcast is that the composer already knows how to write music. So what about that same question, let's switch it from a marketing perspective. So what are the 10% of things that these composers that are here trying to build their career, they could do to build more connections with conductors and ensembles and get their music in front of people? And let's just make the assumption 
that they have the compositional voice. Yeah. Got it. Um, <clears throat> with my students, uh, very first lesson, and this is a lesson that's passed on to me from my days at University of Miami, you know, I draw a circle on the board. Yeah, and I, I look at that circle, I say, do you see that? And they say, yes, I, no, it was a circle. I said, that's a circle of marketability. Anything that you write that falls within that circle, somebody's gonna listen to, all right? Now, if the center of that circle would be that that is the flavor of the day, the month, the year, the billboard hot top of the hot 100, you know, you choose your, your metaphor, okay? But that's, that's dead center, that's, that's the cultural taste of today. Okay, your job, make sure you know what that is, but your job is not to replicate that. Your job is to, more, to more, be more towards the edge of that circle. Somebody's still gonna listen to it, but it's gonna be different enough, okay, to stand out, you know? Now, by the way, if, if we're at the edge of that circle, okay, and you write here, right at the very edge, but you're still inside, okay, but just the other side of that, nobody's gonna hear it. That's not very much difference, and it's, both of them are a long way from that center. But trying to write just inside that circle means somebody's going to hear it. And then hopefully somebody's going to start gravitating towards you. Once you're successful, then the circle moves to you. And you become the center of the circle. So now your next job is to write towards the edge of the circle again. You're going to spend your career moving circles. How can we define where the edge of the circle is? What tips do you have is it score study? Is it looking at the hot sellers for these publishers to define what marketability means in any given year? Uh, it is all of those things, okay? It's mo much more difficult now than it, it has ever been. Uh, it's interesting to look at, quote, sellers, but sellers now don't necessarily indicate the most used music because of this new digital world that we live in, you know, uh, so, uh, which is really re unfortunate. So this is where marketing skills come in for people to actually, for composers to actually get in and start reading uh, analytics, okay, and in a way, looking at data trends, actually, you know, learning how to use hashtags and, and search and look at, uh, look at how people are trending towards music, look at their, uh, at their likes and dislikes uh, in, in very incredible ways. Uh, that's something now more important than ever. You know, when somebody does uh, do something that is new and different and all of a sudden people begin to trend towards that, the composer's got to see that really, really early. You know, I still, uh, you know, I, t I tell people I've had some young band hits, you know, that are still uh, very, very uh, uh, successful. You know, uh, if I had not uh, looked at alternative rock bands like the Smashing Pumpkins, you know, then those wouldn't have existed. I started looking at some rhythmic interaction where I'm going, wait a minute, why are people gravitating towards this? And I went, wow, listen to the way this rhythm is interacting with this. And so I would take that idea. It's just an idea of interacting rhythms. You can't copyright a rhythm, you know, and uh, all of a sudden then start that idea of interactive play, uh, independence of line, and all of a sudden those things became hits. It's being sensitive enough to everything that's going on around us. In other words, take the, take the blinders off. I love that, I lo and I love your idea of the circle. And, and you had said here in just a moment ago um, about using score study and trying to analyze data to see where, where the trend is moving. And it seems to me like if you, if the center of the circle is the hot topic, right? And you said over time, we want to move that circle to where we're riding and then, and then move outside again. If you're not on the front edge of that movement, if you're not the front of the wave, it's best not to jump on the bandwagon. Is that true? Uh, not necessarily. Um, like anything else, actually, if you, if let's get out of music, let's just talk business. Okay. Yeah. When somebody has a, uh, somebody has a really good idea, often the innovators in that are not the ones that reap the greatest reward. It's going to be those that go, wow, this is a really great idea. Okay. And all of a sudden they, they hop on this. For example, let's, uh, you know, I got here to this convention hall this morning using Uber, you know, however, look at the success of Lyft. You know, look at the success of Lyft. It's shocking, you know, absolutely shocking. Here was somebody else's idea, but they did it in a different way. You know, so does that mean we have to hop on the bandwagon? Perhaps. I do know as a young composer, uh, I think even though you, though you may never release it, it might be wise to hop on the bandwagon. If you're trying to study something, know what it is, it might be wise for you to go actually go ahead and create in that world, okay? And uh, so you have a, uh, an idea of what this look and feel 
is, you know, uh, as opposed to just thinking about it. It's um, almost like a, it's, it's different uh, having thoughts and then are putting those into actual words, articulating those words. When you put it into words, uh, it's a totally different uh, power set, you know, and a totally different skill. So sometimes we have to articulate, and that includes musically. Sure. I want to be respectful of your time, so just a few more questions here. But I'm interested in a story that was a learning experience for you. And I use that term carefully as opposed to failure. I'm looking for a moment when you tried to do something from a business perspective, not just a compositional perspective, and it didn't work like you thought. And then you've been able to use that experience to move forward even better the next time. Great question. I, I can offer multiple, but let, let me take one. I, I was commissioned uh, by one of the Air Force bands. Uh, this is back in the mid to late 90s, I think it's probably 96 or so, to write a piece, it was actually for the Air Force Band at Wright-Patterson Air Force Base, and uh, so uh, they wanted a piece that was uh, descriptive of the history of flight, from the, the, the Wright brothers' first flight, which was 12 seconds, to the Apollo missions, and uh, so uh, there was a book published out of Wright-Pat, and, uh, and the commander there, the assistant commander, uh, suggested that as a title, called 12 Seconds to the Moon, so I wrote a piece called 12 Seconds to the Moon. Uh, I like the piece, I still like the piece to this day, you know? Uh, unfortunately, though, it's very difficult to get the piece now. You know, very difficult. I still think it's very musically valid. Every year, multiple times, how can I get 12 seconds to the moon? My problem was that musically, and I, I was dealing with Air Force musicians, these guys can play. You know, they can play. Uh, I just, in my naivete, thought it would be really great to have two piano parts, not just one. You know? So that means there's very, very few high schools and even colleges and universities that can program it because of an instrumentation choice. Absolutely correct. You know, and even if they can, look at what it takes to move that second piano. If the piano exists in the building, they've got to move it, they've got to retune it, you know, and, and you know, and I, I thought about it years after that, and I'm going, boy, oh boy, you know, and what was interesting is, uh, it was a gentleman, uh, uh, Bob Dingley and Roger Colbert. They were instrumental with uh, in building the, the the Pepper, what we know as Pepper today. You know, and uh, Bob handled all the all the uh, marketing, and uh, Roger Colbert handled all the purchasing. You know, and Roger got really upset at me. You know, really, really upset at me over the second piano part. Uh, so much so that they didn't put it in the catalog, you know, and, uh, you know, they just would they and, and he's going, you, you know, you, you're just nuts at doing this. And you know what? He was right. You know, however, uh, the 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 uh, I did get a little bit of, of satisfaction when they had so many requests for the piece that they actually it sneaked into the catalog a, a year or two later, you know. Uh, but uh, but unfortunately, because of the second piano part, you know, it's not performed as much as it should. You know, and uh, so that was a, a that was an incredible learning experience understanding no matter the art still has got to be sustainable it has to live within our practical world in order for it to be consumed yeah. last question what is something that you've always wanted to discuss but people don't ever talk to you about it because they're so focused on other things that's a tough question as we stare awkwardly into the distance trying to figure out what that question would be. I, you know, I, I've lived a very fortunate life uh, and generally uh, I feel like I'm fairly approachable and, 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 and I'm going to have substantive conversations with, with people that ask me. So I've been, and, I, and, and people are, we, 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 we interact in a very kind profession. You know, it could be really caustic, but you know, people are genuinely interested in this. There are how many tens of thousands of people at this event here right now because we all love music. So I've been so fortunate. I've uh, conducted or presented in every state in this, in this great country and almost every continent in the world. You know, so I've been able to discuss quite a bit. Um, I, I think my only lament is probably, again, going to be that connection between the art of music and the importance of education from the very beginning, music education. You know, uh, to, to, to read that Shakespearean novel, somebody had to teach that child phonics. Somebody had to actually, you know, teach them to read and to write, you know. Uh, and uh, I really wish that our, the, our artistic world, our educational world, uh, there would be uh, greater interaction between the two of them. And I really wish there'd be uh, even greater respect between the two of them. Uh, so incredibly important. I, I, 
lament. If you go to the dictionary, uh, uh, you know, we like to think of literacy. We like to think of music lit- literacy. You know, a child's got to be able to read and, you know, and be a literate human being. But the actual definition of literacy is the ability to read and to write in a given language. And I lament that our, maybe our educational community might not understand the importance of teaching students to write in the universal language of music. And we don't get enough of that kind of interaction because they think, particularly in band, orchestra, choir world, they think that, oh my God, lines and spaces and ranges and transpositions and all that kind of stuff. No, teach pop songwriting, you know? Let them, let them create. There are so many different ways we can create so that, that, that students begin to truly become musically literate and be able to express themselves originally through that language of music. I wish there was much more discussion in that area. It's beautiful. Thank you so much for your time, Robert. I really appreciate this conversation. I, I, I value it tremendously, so thank you. Thank you, sir. Nice to see you. This episode of The Portfolio Composer has been supported by Dorico, the new professional music notation and composition software from Steinberg. Dorico has been designed from the ground up to be a flexible and powerful tool. Whether you're a composer or arranger, a teacher or student, working in music engraving and publishing, or working in producing music for media such as film, TV, and games. Compared to other scoring programs, Dorico is fast, fluid, and efficient. Designed for comfortable use on a laptop on the go, but seamlessly scaling up to working on multiple large displays in the studio, it has a beautiful, modern, and uncluttered user interface that allows you to focus on your music. Dorico also embraces the traditions of the finest printed music and produces pages of such balance and proportion, by default, you'll be amazed. You can bring music into Dorico from your existing software using Music XML or MIDI, and you can try Dorico out completely free of charge for 30 days by downloading a trial version from dorico.com slash TPC. Try it today and experience the future of scoring for yourself. 